Hello, my name is Ellen Badone. I'm in the Departments of Anthropology and Religious Studies here at McMaster University. And I'm very pleased today to be able to do an interview with Dr. Richard Preston, one of my colleagues from the Anthropology Department. Dick is retired now. Dick worked for many years among the Cree in Northern Ontario and Northern Quebec. And he's the author of a book called Cree Narrative, The Personal Meaning of Events, which was published in 2002 by McGill Queen's University Press. And I'm very happy to be able to ask uh, Dick a few questions today about his experiences of working among the Cree. And I would enjoy answering them. When was the first time that you were able to go north and work with the Cree? That was June of 1963. Mm -hmm. I was a graduate student. And uh, I remember the date because when we flew in, there was still ice on the bay, and it was June 23rd, and I was surprised to see still ice, uh, ice June there. 23rd. Not solid, but quite a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, where, where did you go that first time in 1963? That first time, we went to Wiscaganish. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason was uh, that uh, my supervisor, John Honigman, wanted more work done in the James Bay area. And uh, being a graduate student, we had to have a supervisor. And she wanted to go somewhere where she could wear jeans. And so we had to go on the Anglican side of the bay. And Wiscaganish was the first community on the Anglican side of the bay. To, to get a mental map, if you think of uh, James Bay, mm -hmm. it's the little bit that sticks down below Hudson Bay. Right. And Wiscaganish is on the Quebec side? On the Quebec side. Mm -hmm. And it's the one that's nearest the bottom of the bay on the Quebec side. Yeah. And how frequently have you been able to return to Wiscaganish? Oh, well, I went uh, for seven consecutive summers and a few brief winter trips. I was teaching uh, after the first couple of years. So I'd go up after uh, Christmas and get back in time for classes. And then uh, been back uh, many times since. I, I would. I haven't got a tally, but let's say between 15 and 20 times. And always to Wiscaganish or other communities no, as well? No, I've been to uh, East Maine and Leminchi and Fort George and Nemeska and uh, communities on the Ontario side of the bay mm -hmm. as well. But mm -hmm. I began in Wiscaganish and I spent most of the time there. And all the people in the other communities where you've worked have also been Cree? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what the environment that uh, the Cree people live in is like? Is it a very tough environment? Well, it's a subarctic environment, and it's uh, what's called the boreal forest, which is uh, mainly a black spruce forest that extends all the way across Canada and Asia and part of, of northern Europe as well. Are the trees uh, fairly small? Uh, scrubby spruce or large? Uh, if, they're, if they're right next to a creek or a river, they can get large. But otherwise, because the land is so marshy, uh, you have to get quite a distance back from James Bay or Hudson's Bay to, to uh, get any dry land. And uh, they, uh, the Crees uh, refer to the people living around the, the bay as Winnebagoites. Wait, Winnebagoites which means uh, people of the Muskeg. Muskegawak is another uh, term for it, Muskeg. So Muskeg is that sort of low-lying, marshy ground right. with yeah. permafrost. Peat moss, you know, mm -hmm. and discontinuous permafrost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is it a, a kind of environment that's hospitable for people to live in? Only if you really know your stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, for, mm -hmm. for most people, it would be a very uh, a scary place to get dropped down in. But uh, for Crees who know the bush and know the uh, habits and the movements of animals, then, uh, except during particular years when the animal populations crash, uh, it's a, a good place. So uh, Cree people before uh, European contact uh, were mobile. Uh, they didn't have uh, villages they lived in all year round. Is that right? That's right. They were mobile, but they were not wandering. They were not nomadic in the sense of just going anywhere. They had a, what we could call an ecological range, and that was a territory they were familiar with, and they would move around that range. And each family would have their own, their own land, and adjacent families uh, would respect that. And then in the summers, they'd all come together at a good place for fishing and have uh, 
period of, of rest and relaxation and ceremony and weddings and things like that. So in the summer you'd see bigger groups of people. In the winter, how big a, a group would uh, most of these family groups be? Yeah, the, the family groups would range anywhere from a, a married couple with just a couple of kids who and uh, up to perhaps 20 or at the most 25 people, but probably the average would be 10 to 15 people in a winter group. And uh, what kind of accommodation would they have in the winter? Well, uh, if they're moving about, then they would have a, a teepee that would be dug down into the snow a couple of feet and then lined with balsam boughs or spruce boughs for insulation and for comfort. And uh, then they would have the caribou skins uh, sewn together and on poles and then snow uh, around the bottom piled up against the skins to make it airtight. Quite comfortable, actually. Not large, but very comfortable. And uh, if they had to move camp, they would just take down the, the, the yeah. TP and move the poles and the skins? Right. And they might not even take the poles with them if they were going just, any distance. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was a portable, uh, portable community, you would say, or family. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, uh, prior to uh, the introduction of snowmobiles, people used sleds, I guess, to they get around. Toboggans, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, actually, there were sleds as well, largish uh, wooden sleds, although I didn't see them. I know that they were used. Uh, but toboggan is a Cree word, dabanask. And uh, those were uh, the main way of carrying goods. But people tended to, to live light because it's mm -hmm. whatever you have, you have to pull. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, the men would laboriously break trail in the snow by snowshoeing ahead, and then the women would come pulling the toboggans and children behind the, the toboggans. And uh, I guess they must have traditionally uh, made what they needed from the resources that were available. Yes, wood, stone, bone, that was the main part of it. Yeah. And skin, of course, animal skin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like some of the articles of clothing uh, up behind you, like the, yes. the beautiful gloves yeah. there. Moose hide mitts and the mm -hmm. beaver fur uh, trim. Yeah. Uh, these are one of my children's uh, moccasins, but this is what children characteristically wore. These are decorated with beads as well. They might be decorated with silk thread. And the, the design on the, the moccasins was so that there wouldn't be a seam down the middle that the snowshoe traces would push into your feet. So mm -hmm. there was a, it was not just for appearance, it was also for practicality. Uh -huh. Practicality comes first, but what's pleasing to the eye comes a close second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As you can see from something like this or like this, these are purely decorative. So can you tell us a little bit about the spirituality of northern Aboriginal people in Canada, like the Cree? Surely. Okay. I know, of course, most about the, the James Bay Cree. And uh, there I'd say that uh, spirituality is based on the, the conviction that the world is filled with persons of many kinds, and only some of those are human persons. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. of them are animal persons. Some of them are purely spiritual uh, persons. And then there are some things that we wouldn't think of as being a person at all. Uh, a toboggan, for instance, is regarded as having a kind of a, a, a spiritual uh, aspect to it. And uh, so some things that we would say were inanimate, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. in fact, were thought of differently. And uh, so the, uh, the worldview or the spirituality of the Crees was one of relationships, particularly right relationships, between persons of all kinds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you could see it as beginning with a family, mm -hmm. right relationships within the family, and then with the larger group, uh, right relationships and how to maintain those there, and then out to what you could call a great community of persons that would mm -hmm. take in animals uh, and uh, uh, other kinds of beings as well. So would you say that for the Cree, almost everything was believed to have a kind of spiritual component? Even things like rocks and landforms? Uh, yeah, but we have to be a little careful here because it wasn't all the same kind of, of uh, spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, what a human being had uh, 
spiritually was far different from what a toboggan or, mm. or something mm -hmm. like that would have. So uh, it wasn't a kind of uh, every, but one size fits all spiritual right. company. Right. Yeah. And uh, the thing was to know each of these kinds of creatures very, very well. Mm -hmm. And that, after all, is a kind of a spiritual thing, too. Uh, and uh, if you knew the spirit of, let's say, a goose or of a bear or of a caribou or of a beaver very, very well, then you could develop a close personal spiritual mm -hmm. relationship. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, that uh, it was important to treat all these uh, persons, whether they're human persons or other than human persons, in the right way. Mm. What, what would the Cree say is the right way? Well, to, uh, to not generate any kind of conflict, but more positively than that, to have a kind of friendship relationship, uh, which didn't imply close intimacy necessarily, it can be a kind of friendly distance uh, involved. But it was believed that the animals that the Crees ate in order to stay alive were put in this world so that humans could kill them and eat them in order to live. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. had they not been able to kill them and eat them, they would have died. So uh, there's uh, not much conflict there. So you mm -hmm. want to have right relationships with the animals that you depend on for your living. And if a person, through carelessness or arrogance or uh, for some other reason, were to act in a way that was contemptuous or disrespectful, uh, then uh, it was thought that uh, the animal might be aware of that and leave the area. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, even to the point where some animals, very powerful animals, might know, uh, in a sense, what a person was saying. And it was believed that a bear uh, could hear a person talking about him and didn't like it. And so the Crees would use a euphemism, you know, short tail or old porcupine or something like uh, that. When uh, talking instead, about, of, instead of saying the word bear. bear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, actually, you have a bear skull there. I do. Yeah. 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 Now, you said this one is a special one that was decorated uh, ceremonially? That's right. Yeah. This what was a bear skull that was, instead of being put up, uh, hung up in the trees as they usually were, uh, this one would be kept and decorated with uh, blue, uh, either it could be stripes, could be dots, depends on the preference of the man, but made to look mm, celebratory, really. Mm -hmm. uh, made to look mm -hmm. colorful and, and uh, to, in a sense, to please the bear. And then, if they were going to have a feast, they would set out uh, this bear skull uh, as a part of the feast and rub a little bit of, of uh, beaver grease or something like that on mm -hmm. the bear's teeth mm -hmm. before they began to eat themselves, mm -hmm. sharing mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. showing their respect uh, for the bear uh -huh. in doing that. It's almost like giving the bear a bit of the, the food. Right. It was that, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And also, even when it wasn't a feast, they might throw a little bit of food into the fire for whoever it went to. Uh -huh. Just as, again, a right. kind of sharing of, of uh, of their livelihood mm -hmm. with others. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know the bear is a very important animal for a lot of subarctic people. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Well, for one thing, bears are faster and stronger than humans. But I think even more than that, uh, humans have to stick it out and keep working uh, through the very coldest <laughs> of, of winter, and bears don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of meat on a bear, and it's delicious. And bear grease, particularly, there are two kinds of bear grease. One sort of like applesauce, and the other is more liquid. And I remember being told about this originally by my mentor, John Blackned, and I was trying to show that I was with him, and so I said, so I, I guess it's sort of like butter. And he thought for a minute, he said, no, more like jam. <laughs> and, and, you know, when I was at a bear feast subsequently and had some of this, it was. It, it's a little bit sweet. Is that right? So he was being precise as mm -hmm. well as mm -hmm. saying that it was more special than, than mm -hmm. butter. You know. mm -hmm. So it is a wonderful food and uh, there's a lot of it. And if you have uh, a fairly good winter, you might know that there was a bear hibernating in a place, but you wouldn't go after it. Uh, you might think, well, maybe we'll wait for another year. Mm -hmm. uh, because bears are relatively sedentary. 
Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And so they'll be there, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. unlike caribou that migrate. And bears and beavers are, are a little more dependable. So it's a resource you could count on. Uh, it is. Like a bank account. <laughs> it is, yeah, like a big savings account. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it sounds to me as though the spiritual beliefs of the Cree people were very much tied up with uh, the practical aspects of oh, yeah. how to make a living in this harsh environment. Right. Would you say that's true? Right. Yeah. I, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't recall ever hearing anything that struck me as being disengaged from uh, the practicalities of daily life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Now, there's another uh, Canadian anthropologist who's worked uh, among northern peoples mm-hmm. uh, further west, the Athabascan peoples, the Dene peoples, mm-hmm. and uh, that's Robin Riddington, yes. who I'm sure you know. Yeah. And uh, I have read articles by Robin Riddington in which he argues that um, the technology, the sort of the, the know-how mm-hmm. that the northern peoples had mm-hmm. uh, included uh, more than just tools. Mm-hmm but also included uh, knowledge of the proper way to relate right. to these other than human beings right. in the environment. Right, hunting strategies. And, right. You know, you know, I think w- it's a brilliant article. I like it very, very much. Mm-hmm. What, what he uh, caught me with was, we talk about technology, let's look at the ology part of that, a science of. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think it is and uh, a very apt way of, of looking at it because we tend to think of hunters as being sort of beetle-browed and just you know, like, a, I don't know, a peasant with a hoe and a shovel or something like that, but uh, it's much more than that. It's a very rich understanding of when to use, what tool, in what way, in what place, what animal, what season, and, and so on. So there's a, a, a very extensive kind of what is now called traditional ecological knowledge mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. Uh, is uh, what technology really is about. Now, once I think you told a story about hunting a fox. Oh, yes. Can you tell us that story? Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is not the only way to hunt a fox, mm-hmm. uh, but this is one way. You, uh, you find a a fox's tracks, and uh, then you uh, mound up the snow about 30 inches, I guess, 24 to 30 inches above the surface of the snow, and then you flatten the top of this cone a little bit, and you put a trap, a little bit of birch bark, a little bit of snow over the birch bark so that it looks like it's all just snow, and then you take the bait, there's no bait in the trap anywhere, mm-hmm. and you take the bait and you put it around the sides of the mound. What kind of bait would you use? Well, you'd use uh, meat of some kind, uh-huh, uh-huh. yeah. And uh, so then you'd uh, leave it there and, and uh, walk away with a little smile on your face and wait for the fox to come. And the fox would come and he would see the mound and he would know that wasn't normal. And he would smell the bait and he would be suspicious. <laughs> so then he would circle a trap, checking it out. And he would try one piece of the bait okay. So then he'd eat the rest of the bait. And then he'd wonder where that food came from. And when a fox wants to think about something, he likes to go to a little rise and sit down. That's the... Mm-hmm. Now, I, I thought maybe I was being strung a line uh, the first time I heard that story, but I've since got it in uh, two other communities from a fellow at Nastasny and a fellow at uh, uh, Winesk in, in Ontario. So I think it's legit. Yeah. But there's an example of mm-hmm. technology, okay? The strategy mm-hmm. is everything there. Mm-hmm. The trap is, mm-hmm. is just a trap. Mm-hmm. The bait is just bait. Right. And, but the thing that is important is the knowledge of the fox. Yep. Yeah. Right. This is the way the fox thinks. Mm-hmm. This is what the fox will do when he wants to think in this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, in, in a sense, would you say there's a sort of a spiritual component to that kind sure. of knowledge? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's mm-hmm. almost a deep play going on between the hunter and the animal that he's hunting. Mm-hmm. And the animal, at some level, perceives the hunter, but not, you know, not up front, because then the animal would run away. But mm-hmm. In, mm-hmm. in some inward way, the animal is having a kind of play with the hunter and the hunter with the animal. Mm-hmm. So there's a spiritual relationship going on at the same time that there is this practical one. 
And I think in some of your writings you've said that uh, part of the Cree idea of being a good hunter or competent hunter um, is that the animals will give themselves up oh, to yes. the competent hunter, yeah. but not to the incompetent hunter. Yeah, or, or t I guess incompetence would include being disrespectful, that's right. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, so animals uh, will, uh, if, if they didn't want to have their presence known, you wouldn't find their tracks at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Once you have found their tracks, they're not going to run into the teepee and say, kill me, kill me. Uh, you have to then engage in the chase and uh, use your technology in order to capture them. But uh, the idea is that there is this very fundamental reciprocal relationship between animals and humans. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about shamans in traditional Cree society? Yes. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to do is start off by saying that shamanism is not uh, really a, a kind of exotic uh, performance. Shamanism is an extension of these relationships that we've been talking about between uh, the animals and the hunters, where there's a kind of spiritual communication going on. Shamanism just takes that a little further. And uh, uh, presumably, virtually anybody could develop shaman's uh, competence, but relatively few people do. And uh, like other religious persuasions, it requires uh, constant uh, attention mm -hmm. to developing those abilities, in particular, listening to your dreams and uh, listening to the experiences, mental experiences you should have when you're out in the bush and, and so on. And uh, also listening to the, the reports of others, including of uh, a shaman. So it's an extension of ordinary human abilities to a further extent. It might include predicting the future. It might include uh, seeing things over a distance. Where are the animals now? Mm -hmm. Or finding lost objects, or knowing that somebody was coming but still a distance away. It might also include curing a person mm -hmm. whose uh, sickness, particularly if it is caused by some other shaman, mm -hmm. and inflicting harm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, uh, it's getting the news over uh, some distance, and in fact, the word for the, the conjured tent, Koshachigan, was applied later on to the television because you get the news over a long distance and you can see it. Uh, Tell us a bit about what the, the conjuring tent was. Okay, a conjuring tent was uh, made of uh, supple poles, uh, uprights that were bent into a kind of a barrel shape, and then there'd be a hoop around the top of poles lashed together, and another one uh, around about three-fifths of the way down. And uh, that frame is fairly springy. It would be covered then uh, with a canvas, or years ago with caribou skin. And uh, the shaman would go inside. They don't call him a shaman, they call him Koshaptam, the one who's kneeling in there. And uh, he would then uh, hope that he would be visited by what we, uh, it's, it's awkward to call it a guardian spirit because that assumes a bit too much of a military relationship, but a kind of attending spirit. Is that a, a mistabio? A mistabio, that's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Mistabio literally is big, mista, and nabio is man, mm -hmm. but he's not physically big. It's what he can do. It's his power that's big, as if he were uh, a giant in power. And uh, so the mistabio would come, and then the mistabios of other shaman would come visiting. So it was a mm -hmm. kind of a social event. And then you might also have, uh, coming even before the mustabios of other men, you might have uh, the spirits of some animals coming. Mm -hmm. Bears, fish, there's a, a boss of the fish uh, that might come. And, and the, the shaman might uh, say, well, you know, the people around here want more fish. And the fish boss would say, well, you know, I can't give you more because I have to think of the generations to come. Mm -hmm. And then they might have an argument about it and, and maybe they'd get a little more fish. And, uh, and people outside the tent would, would hear outside. the noise, That's would right. hear the they noise of hear, the, the discussions. They can, they can hear, and mm -hmm. the spirits sing. They don't speak in, uh -huh. in uh, just spoken tones. And uh, the, uh, the conjurer uh, speaks uh, 
more normally. And uh, so there's a kind of a conversation between the singing people and the, uh, who are referred to really as the flying people because they come right. out of space into the conjuring tent. I have observed this only once uh, and uh, made a recording of it, and mm -hmm. uh, that's in the Cree narrative book. Mm -hmm. Would there be only the, the one uh, human person mm -hmm. in the conjuring tent yes, at a time? Just yeah. the, the one conjurer. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. If somebody else wanted to conjure, then maybe after this first person went out, mm -hmm. another person would go in. Mm -hmm. I didn't mm -hmm. observe that myself, right, but I know right. that can happen. Yeah. Uh, traditionally, uh, were shamans only male, or were there any women shamans among the That's an interesting question, and, and when I put that to my mentor, John Blacknett, he said, well, he supposed a woman could do it, but in saying it that way, my assumption was that he hadn't heard of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't want to rule it out, but it didn't seem too likely to him. Right, right. And uh, if we uh, look a little further afield over into the northwestern Ontario area, uh, there are stories of women who were mm -hmm. uh, in conjuring tents. Mm -hmm. Certainly women can have conjuring power without using a conjuring tent. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Now, you say you only saw the conjuring tent uh, once. Mm -hmm. uh, would that have been in the 60s? Or? Yes, yeah. it would have been 1965. Yeah. And uh, a man from an inland community was down visiting Muscaganish at the time. and was asked by several people, and then John asked on his own behalf, but also on my behalf. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I was given permission to suspend the microphone of my tape recorder, sort of like a snare, outside mm -hmm. the tent. Mm -hmm. And uh, while it was going on, the shaman uh, joked that I should have put the microphone inside the tent, because then I could hear more clearly. <laughs> and, uh, so it, it was welcomed. It wasn't yeah, an intrusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wondering uh, how the uh, uh, the coming of Christianity uh, changed or influenced uh, yes. traditional rituals like this. Yeah, uh, for a long time what it meant was that people conjured in the bush and uh, listened to the missionary at the post. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, actually uh, this particular uh, ceremony that I uh, recorded was done about a hundred yards from the Anglican church and there was a complaint from the Anglican priest the next day that mm -hmm. it had been really rather close. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so... I mean, he didn't mind it happening, it was just well, too close. Well, he didn't <laughs> mind, but that, I think, reflects his, uh, his broad-mindedness because earlier missionaries uh, were uh, very vehemently opposed mm -hmm. to this kind of thing, and they gathered up the traditional drums and burned them and, and uh, uh, outlawed uh, conjuring tents. And, and so on, because they saw it uh, as being in league with the devil, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. did the Pentecostals who came in in the 1970s and mm -hmm. were very critical of that kind of thing. Now, you mentioned uh, Anglicans and Pentecostals. Are those the, the two main denominations among the Cree? The Anglicans came first in the mid-1800s. Uh, a little further to the south, Moose Factory, there were Methodists for a few years before the Anglicans. And uh, the Catholics had been coming into that region uh, earlier than that, but weren't established there until later. And then there was a northern Canada evangelical mission of Baptists who came in the 50s, and then in the 70s, the Pentecostals. Mm -hmm. And it's the Pentecostals and the Anglicans that are mainly mm -hmm. found on the East Coast communities now. So would you say that uh, most Cree now are nominally uh, Christian, or uh, as Christian as anybody in uh, Southern Canadian society? In, in some communities there is a very tight Anglican community, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. which would be hard to find the, uh, in a Southern right. Canadian. Yeah. But mm -hmm. there are also others where it's uh, not nearly so uh, lively. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's also the, what we could call the, the new traditionalism, which is more from the prairies, but that's not a Christian thing. That's largely a, a native uh, thing that emphasizes self-discipline, temperance, and mm. uh, uh, the uh, pipe ritual and drumming and so on. So that's sort of a revival of some traditional... Uh, but not of a local tradition. Mm. That, that's the mm -hmm. important thing there. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. But so, it is very, uh, uh, very important now. Yeah. 
Would you say that uh, for young uh, Cree persons growing up in this generation, um, the worldview that you described that involves the respect for other than human persons, uh, the spiritual component in animals and other parts of the environment, would you say that that has persisted uh, despite Christianity and all the changes that we've seen? Or would you say that's something that's uh, slowly disappearing? I'd, I'd say that uh, it's much diminished mm -hmm. uh, because a, a lot of what I described for you is something that's learned from first-hand experience in the bush and mm -hmm. relating to other animals. Mm -hmm. And what we have now are, are two generations of people who are basically townspeople mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, for whom television uh, is uh, is a Kwashopchagan, but a Kwashopchagan is not a Kwashopchagan. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So uh, there has been a change. People are aware of this. Some people are concerned to try to uh, strengthen the old ways. Others think that they're best let go. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, certainly the Pentecostals are not too strong on, on the old ways. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd, I'd say overall there's quite a tolerance mm -hmm. between ways of, of uh, of being, ways of believing, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, initial Pentecostal uh, movement was quite exclusive, but it no longer is. People mm -hmm. are quite uh, accepting of each other. So uh, it's, it's plural, and there is a secular uh, uh, group as well. Mm -hmm. and, you know. Would you say that uh, all these different groups uh, share the same uh, value about what constitutes a good death, the kind of composure and self-restraint that you talk about in your article? I think that uh, not only the approach to death, but the approach to relations between people, uh, some of these very most fundamental relationships have persisted. And uh, I, I think this is something that people do without thinking about it. This is mm -hmm. just the best way to do things. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about denominations or, or particular practices, uh, but people want to get along without generating conflict. And mm -hmm. if conflict gets going, don't increase it. You know, walk away from it. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so with death and with childbirth as well, uh, but uh, with death in, in particular, since you've asked about that, the idea is to have a good death, and uh, that means to uh, for one thing, to have your relationships to other people in good repair, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. but also to go out uh, uh, willingly, if not gladly, uh, to meet your death. And uh, without knowing where you're going from there, nonetheless, mm -hmm. you can start out uh, bravely, maybe, mm -hmm. or at least uh, with composure. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dick. Oh, you're very welcome.